Hello, it is great to have you with us today. My name's Julia, I'm from our Manchester campus and today we have an amazing preach brought to us from our Manchester Central campus. So get ready, get your notebooks, get on the edge of your seats and get ready to spend an amazing time in God's Word. So thank you for having me back. Uh, one thing is to be invited somewhere, another thing is to be invited back. Um, I love your pastor so much, and I know you hear this all the time. Well, I don't know if you do. I hope you do, uh, but I do love your pastor so much. Last night I flew in, and I spent all after after I had dinner with Pastor Glenn. You know, I was riding with my wife, and she's like, "How was it?" I was like, "Oh man, I just love Glenn so much. You know, every time I get to spend time with him and." And so as well, like just it's so encouraging. And what I love about your pastors, which you might just say, well, that's normal, is that you just feel seen and heard. And I just really want to encourage you never to take your pastors for granted. And uh, so come on, can we just show some honor and appreciation for your pastors? Thank you so much for who you are. And, uh, and I think 2025 is the year where we keep Glenn out of the hospital. Should we just, come on, can we just declare that together? You know, we are keeping him out of the hospital 2025 in the name of Jesus. But I wonder if you've ever asked the question, where is God? Where is God? Uh, we in church, are we allowed to be honest right now? Uh, have you ever had that feeling like, God, where are you? You know, you look around and, you know, as, as Jesus followers, our responsibility is to find Jesus for ourselves, yeah? But then secondly, our other responsibility is to help others find Him as well. A number of years ago, I was tucking our, one of our girls into bed, and we got three daughters, that's called a hat trick, and, you know, I was tucking into bed, and then as I'm leaving the room, she goes, hey, Daddy, I'm like, what? She goes, I got a question. I'm like, oh, here we go. And she goes, you know, like, if God is real, why doesn't He just show Himself? I was like, what do you mean? And she goes, well, you say Santa Claus is real. I'm like, go on. You say the Easter Bunny is real, but you also say Jesus is real. So which one is it? You know when your kids ask you a question and you don't really know how to answer it? Anyone? Parents, come on. So I did what any good parents uh, would do in that moment. I just said, shut up and go to sleep. But you know, as, I'm, as I was leaving the room, I was like, that's a good question. Where is God? And so I want to speak a message today called hide and seek. Hide and seek. Because I don't know about you, I think sometimes when we think about our walk with Jesus, we kind of, I don't know, I think we imagine it that it's kind of like, well, I'm just skipping, you know, through the park and I'm just walking through life. And if I need God, if I need an encouragement, I can always just do a flick and pick. You know what I'm saying? And so you flick through the Bible and you try and find something that's gonna encourage you, which I would encourage you not to do. You know, that can go horribly wrong. You know, you do a flick and pick and it's like, Judas went and hung himself. And then you do it again. It's like, go and do likewise. So maybe not. Maybe that's not the best idea. But you know, for me, my walk with God is not a walk in the park. I feel like every time I read the Word, or rather when the Word reads me, it feels more like a wrestle. It feels more like a wrestle between flesh and spirit. It feels like a wrestle between the truth of the Bible and the realities of life. You know what I'm saying? Like you look at the promises in the Bible and then you look at your realities and you're like, well, where are you? I look at God can provide and I see the stack of bills. I see that God can heal and, you know, someone is in hospital again. You know, you, you look around and you see the realities of life and you see the truth of the Bible and you're caught in that tension and you're kind of like, God, where are you? Like, it, it's almost as if when I don't need Him, He is everywhere. And then the moments that I really need God, He is nowhere to be found. I mean, I think about the disciples, you know, Jesus, He looks at them in the eyes just at the end of, you know, His time on earth and really kindly and lovingly, He goes, I will never leave you or forsake you. And they were like, aww, and He's gone. 
you know, in the Gospel of John, he's like, come follow me. And then a few chapters later, he's like, where I go, you cannot follow. Wait, which one is it, God? Do you know, is, is God a God that we can find or is He a hidden? This is such a frustrating part of God. I think one of the other challenges as humans, we so often lean into the extreme of anything. You know, whenever we talk to each other, whenever we argue, whenever we discuss, it's always the extreme point of view that we talk about. You know, we, we find ourselves talking about off, on, hot, cold, black, white, up, down. Everything is always extreme. Now, the extreme is good for explanation, but it's horrible for application. You know, we can use the extreme point of view to explain something, but wisdom is found somewhere in the middle ground. Wisdom is found somewhere in the tension between the two in that gray area. I think about King Solomon in all his wisdom. You know, he's out walking with his scribe, Proverbs 24, and they obviously find some honey because in Proverbs 24, he goes, hey, write this one down. If you find honey, eat it. It's good for you. And they're like, great, great proverb, hit it again, you know, home run. And you can imagine him eating, 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 because a chapter later he goes, hey, write this one down. If you find honey, don't eat too much of it, or it's gonna make you vomit. <laughs> well, which one is it, you know, Solomon? Like, which one should we go for? But life is lived somewhere in the middle ground. I mean, even the prophet Isaiah, who had so many supernatural encounters with God, listen to how he describes God. In Isaiah 45, 15, he says, truly you are a God who has been hiding himself. The famous atheist Bertrand Russell, he said that if he was ever faced with God when he died, he would demand an explanation for why God made the evidence of his existence so insufficient. See, to the atheist, a hidden God just proves that he doesn't exist. To the skeptic, it just produces more doubt. To the believer, we don't quite know what to do with this, so we're like, well, it's all just part of his divine plan. So which one is it? Well, I think it comes down to what type of relationship do we believe God, he desires with us? You know, because if we think that God, he wants to just, for us to intellectually know that he exists, then yes, then it's preposterous that God doesn't just reveal himself on the hour, every hour on all our phones. You know, if God just wanted a logical knowledge that we just logically should know, yes, he exists, he should just pop on our screen going, hello, and then disappear again. <laughs> but if God wanted something more intimate, if God wanted a deeper relationship with us, then he's not just appealing to our mind, he appeals to our hearts. And then he invites us on a relationship and he invites us on a journey of discovering who he is in my life. Not who he is in Glenn's life, not who he is in your life or their life. No, who he is in my life. And so he invites us in on a discovery of who God is. But at the core of this is how do you see God? How do you see God? If you see God as this distant, you know, dormant and disinterested God who is, has no desire in a relationship with me. Well, there's no point pursuing him. There's no point of trying to find him because obviously he doesn't wanna be found. But that is not the God that we see in the Bible. We don't see a God who is disinterested in his people. We don't see a God who just made it all, you know, started it all and then walked away. No, we see a God who leans in to his creation. We see a God who is leaning into our lives. We see a God who is interested in every detail of our lives. I mean, listen to what Hebrews chapter 11, verse six says. It says, without faith, it is impossible to please God because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. Now, I know preachers say this all the time, but I mean what I'm about to say. <laughs> if there is one thing, <laughs> if there is one thing I want you to take away from this message, it's this sentence. God doesn't hide to be hidden. He hides to be found. God doesn't hide to be hidden. He does hide to be found. Have we got any parents here today? Anyone? Anyone in the other locations? Any parents? You can put up your hand. You know, now when you play hide and seek with your kids, we know as parents the aim is not to win. Okay. Maybe the rules are different here. Uh, 
in Denmark, the, the rules are that the parents, you know, when you play hide and seek with your kids, the aim is not to win. I see dads taking notes, that's amazing. Okay, that's what I'm doing wrong. You know, trust me, you know, like the aim is not for you to win. Now, when, when our kids were, were younger, I'm not trying to brag, but I could have won every single time. You know, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not bragging, but I could. You know, when my, my kids were younger, I could have climbed up in the attic, I could have shut the gate, you know, the door, and I could have hidden there where they couldn't find me and they couldn't even reach me. And I could have been sitting there and heard my, my little girls with their little angelic voices going, Daddy is hiding, yay! Daddy, daddy! And slowly, like slowly the, you know, the, the, the tone would turn into wailing and crying, gnashing of teeth. And I would wait until like they were shivering in fetal position in the corner, had given up all hope of ever finding their dad again. At that point, I would jump down and go, suck it, I win. <laughs> but I didn't do that because that's not the aim. We understand as parents, the aim of hide and seek is not hiding to be hidden. It's hiding to be found. We want to be found, don't we? So we hide in like the most silly places, don't we? We hide behind a couch, we hide behind a curtain, we hide behind like a pot plant, a lamp. And then even when they're too thick and distracted to still not find you, what do we do? Woo, woo. And then finally, you know, they stumble around the corner and they go, there you are. I found you, daddy, silly daddy. Hiding behind a silly thing. I found you. And what do you do as a parent? You go, yeah. Well done. You did find me. How did you ever find me? I made it so difficult. You are so clever. And God is a bit the same, isn't he? We come to church and we go, I found Jesus. I found him. And I'm sure God's like, yeah. Well done. You found me, go ahead, write your name in your little Bible. That's so cute, I love when you do that. How did you ever find me? Because I made it so difficult for me to be found. God wants to be sought after. Much more God, He wants to be found. And today I wanna invite every single person, whatever location you're at, I wanna invite every single person on the greatest game of hide and seek. I wanna invite you on an adventure where you're gonna be telling hide and seek stories. We're gonna get it together and go, oh my gosh, I cannot believe what just happened. I wanna invite you on a great game of hide and seek. So how do we do this? Well, firstly, you've actually gotta believe that God wants to and can be found. I mean, hide and seek, the rules aren't difficult. But in order to play hide and seek, someone needs to be hiding. If you are playing hide and seek and no one's hiding, you're not playing hide and seek, my friend. You're just crazy. <laughs> you know, you're just looking behind trees and bushes and it's like, who are you looking for? No one. Okay, <laughs> you know. You, you first have to believe that God, He exists and He wants to be found. What does that mean? It means that suddenly we change our perspective. Because now we don't just roll up to church. We don't just roll into our daily Bible reading. We don't just go on autopilot because we understand God is hiding. And so I come with a sense of expectation. I come to church and I go, I wonder where He's hiding today. Because you gotta remember, we have a living God, which means we have a moving God, which means where you found Him last week, you might not find Him this week, because He's always moving. He's hiding in different places, and it's your responsibility, it's my responsibility to find Him. So, you know, for some of you, you found Jesus in the worship last week. That was your moment of discovery. But this week, some of you might find Him in the Word. Some of you might have already found Him in the offering. Some of you might find Him in a conversation in the foyer. Some of you might be driving home with your kids and your kids on the back seat are going, you know what they talked about at kids? And then they say something and in that moment you go, there you are, found you. He doesn't hide to be hidden. He hides to be found. 
Jeremiah 29, 11, we know it. I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. Then you will call on me and come and pray to me and, you will listen, and I will listen to you. You will seek me and you will find me when you seek me with all your heart. And one of the most beautiful promises in the Bible, I will be found by you, declares the Lord. I will be found by you. Great sermon, Thomas. Thank you. But how come we don't find him then? Because that sounds great. And I, front row, they're super excited about it. But how come I don't find him in my life then? That's the reality, isn't it? Have you ever noticed that distance distorts reality? The further away you are from someone, it's like, you ever walk down the street and you think you've seen your friend? And you're like, hey, and then you get closer and you're like, oh shoot, that's not my friend. I don't know what you do. I, I just normally just pick the person after them. I'm like, hey, hey, you know, because distance distorts reality. But it's the same in our relationships. When there is distance in your marriage or distance in your, rela- in your friendship or distance in your, you know, your friendship or even your relationships at work or distance in your relationship with your, with your God, we start filling in the gap. We start interpreting things. You know, I, I, we say to our team all the time, hey, if I send you a message, please picture a smile on my face. <laughs> That's the tone, it's sent in. So when you read it, it's just like, you're fired, you know? <laughs> hey, I'm smiling, you know? <laughs> no, it's not true. So, but when your distance distorts reality. That's why sometimes you can hear other Christians and dare I say preachers that, you know, they're preaching from the same Bible, but it's like you're listening to them preach and it's like, Man, your God sounds angry. Your God sounds judgmental. When I read this, I'm reading a love letter from a dad. I'm reading a, a, a father in heaven that just wants to bring his kids home. I'm reading a someone that cannot wait to spend eternity with us. But when there is distance, we distort reality. You know, that's when we come to church and we, we kind of already disqualified ourselves. We're like, you know, you haven't even sat down and you're like, okay, this is for everyone else but me. We start doing that spiritual stock take, you know. We, I don't know how, you know, everyone judges it different. It's like, okay, how many times have I read the Bible this week? You know, four out of seven, well, that's not bad. And prayer, and we start, you know, we have all these measurements and somehow we spit out a result. Have I been a good Christian or a bad Christian? And that somehow gives me access to God or not, even though that doesn't exist. You are either a follower of Jesus or you're not. And my children are my children on their best day as much as they're my children on their worst day. The relationship doesn't change. But we have this idea, don't we, that God is found in a time and a place. We use it in our language. We go, I've I've walked away from God. Then you come to a place like this and we're like, come back to Jesus. And you're like, oh man, all that time lost, all that distance I have to cover. But what we forget is that while you were walking away from Jesus, Jesus followed you. Because He will never leave you, He will never forsake you, He will follow you. He's always following you. See, we gotta remember, Jesus is not found in a time and a place. Jesus is found in the pursuit of Him. The moment you desire Him is the moment you find Him. A matter of fact, you can't even finish His name and you found Him. You say, G, and He is right there. He is found in the pursuit of Him. The moment your heart turns to Him, He's right there. He's right there. What does it say? Matthew 6, uh, 33 says, Seek first the kingdom of God. Seek, it's an active word. That's why your, your direction in life is more important than your position in life. You know, people will come up after a sermon like this and go, oh, but pastor, you don't know where I'm at. And I'll be super pastoral and go, it doesn't matter, I don't care. And they'll be like, what do you mean? Because it's not where you're at that matters. The real question is where are you going? Are you, are you moving towards Jesus or are you moving away from Him? It's your direction in life that matters that we seek Him. You know, someone once said that evangelism is just one beggar telling another beggar where the bread is. And really, isn't that what church is? I mean, you know, whatever season you're going and you're going through right now, 
I don't want to be so arrogant and say, well, you know, God is there. I know, you know, you just need to do A, B, and C, and one, two, three, and then you got him. I don't know where he's hiding in your life. But what I can say is that when I walk through my valley of shadow of death, I found him. And I know he's hiding in your valley somewhere too. I don't know when, and I don't know how, but he is. You just need to find him. So really when we get together as church, it's just one big cheer squad. It's just us cheering each other on, saying, come on, let's find him again. <laughs> let's tell the stories. What hide and seek stories have we got? Hey, you know, let's go and find him again because he is here. We know he's here. We've just got to find him. We've got to find him because he doesn't hide to be hidden. He find, hides to be found. So one thing is that we can find him for ourselves, but that does, that's not the whole story either. Because as Jesus followers, we're not just supposed to find him for ourselves. We're supposed to help other people find him too. In Acts 17, Paul, he's walking through Athens. The Apostle Paul, and he's preparing to, to speak to a crowd and he's kind of figuring out what he's gonna preach on. And you know, he's looking around and he's trying to look at what he should you know, be inspired by. And he's walking through the marketplace and he's walking through and he sees all these statues and he sees a statue to an unknown God. And he's like, all right, I'll speak on that. And then he, he starts out this message, this sermon, and in verse 24, he says, the God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth. He doesn't live in temples built by human hands. He's not served by human hands as if he needed anything. Rather, he himself gives everyone life and breath and everything else. From one man, he made all the nations. They should inhabit the whole earth. Now listen to this. And he marked out their appointed times in history and the boundaries of their land. God did this so that they would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him even though he is not far from any one of us. God chose where you would live, when you would live. God chooses, chooses the when and the where. Now let me ask a question. What if, just asking, what if there was no coincidences. What if in life there was no coincidences? We, 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 we say things, don't we? Like we're like, oh, what a coincidence. We, oh, I can't believe, it. oh, funny. You know, we go like, how did you come to church? Oh, you know, I just happened to be in, in class with, with this person. We just happened to sit next to each other. It's like, what a crazy coincidence. And now they're in church. And I'm sure God's like, cool, good story. I had nothing to do with that one. Because <laughs> could it be if God places the when and where, could it be that three, four generations ago that God, he's like, all right, I need that to happen. So, okay, so this person falls in love with this person. I, you know, this person's gonna get called to move over here and there's no jobs to find here. That's okay, because really I need them to move over here and here, this child's gonna fall in love with this person and they're gonna have a child and, and you know, fast forward 50 years and now they're living in this area, that's the catchment area of that school and they go over here and now she's in this classroom. Fantastic. At the same time, on the other side of the planet, this person is born here and that person travels over here, meets this person, over here they feel a sense of calling, they're getting moved at different things and God's working through them, in them, around them, organize the situations and circumstances so that they come over here and over here, situations happen that pushes them over here. Fast forward 30 years, they end up here, their house could, they couldn't find anything to buy and they're like, oh man, I thought God answered my prayers, but He didn't, oh well, I have to live over here and now they're here, but because they're here and not there, they're now in the catchment area of that school and their kid is now in this class and this person goes, what did you do on the weekend? Well, I go to this church. Church, what's that? Well, I don't know. It's just this and this and this. Oh my gosh, I've always thought about going there. And you go, there you are. I found you. And we take all of that and we say, it was just a coincidence. And God's like, come on, man, really? <laughs> what if there was no such thing as a coincidence? What if a coincidence really is an invitation? What if we were to live lives that were lived with purpose and on purpose? That God doesn't hide to be hidden, He hides to be found. The challenge is that we often want all the initiative to be on God. We want God, God, if you do this, then I'll do that. God, if you do this, then I'll do that. But Jesus said something else, didn't He? Matthew 7, he says, ask, it will be given to you. 
Seek, you will find. Knock and the door will be opened. If you ask, if you seek, if you knock. Well, let me ask you a question. If you knock on a door, whose responsibility is it if the door opens? The one on the other side of the door, isn't it? We have made our knocking the, responsi- the, the, the weighty responsibility of whether or not the door opens. Too many of us, we, we use this word evangelism and, oh man, we've got to redeem that word because really just telling your story, too many of us, we don't share our story or step out in faith, call it evangelism, whatever you want to call it, because we think we are responsible for the outcome. We think we have to land the plane. So, so we treat our relationship with God like, oh, I can't talk about that and, because I, what if they ask a question? I can't, I can't speak like Pastor Glenn. And I, I don't have the theolo- theological background and I don't know how to say this. And, and so almost like our relationship with God becomes like this affair that we have that we don't wanna talk about and we hope that no, nothing serious gets talked about at the dinner table because then it might end up in a conversation about God because we think we are responsible. It's like, I'm not an evangelist. No, but can you share your story. See, we think that we are responsible for the growth when really the Bible says one man plants a seed, someone else waters it, but it's God that makes it grow. Listen church, God has never called you to be successful. He's called you to be faithful. He has never called you to be successful. He's called you to be faithful to be faithful with the opportunity, to be faithful with the coincidence, to be faithful with that you know, invitation, just to be faithful. And can we as people of faith trust God with the success and with the definition of success? Because whenever you tell a story about evangelism, you always, you always get this response, and then what happened? And you know, I have started just saying, you know what, it's none of your business because you were waiting for me to say, and then he fell down on his knees and he repented and he goes, no, save me, preach, I need Jesus. And it's like, no, sometimes it's like, you're weird. Well, was that successful? I don't know, because I don't know two years later when he sits somewhere else and he goes, runs into another Christian who took a gap. And they're sitting having coffee and they say, oh my gosh, I was talking to someone two years ago. They had the same weird story. And this person now is a different story, different lane, different gifting. He goes, oh, why was it weird? I just feel blah, blah, blah. And then it's like, oh, I used to think like that. And then this and this and this happened. And the person's like, oh, wow, I never thought about it like that. There you are. I found you. See, we think we're responsible for the outcome. Let's just be faithful with the opportunity that's in front of us. Whatever it is, just be faithful. Let's go on God assignment. So what did Paul do when he walked through Athens? He's like, what should I speak on? What should I speak on? What should I speak on? What did he look for? He looked for a common ground. He looked for a third space. He looked for something that we could agree on. The unknown God. Bingo. I'll talk about that. What if what we all do is that we start looking for coincidences and we don't see it as just a coincidence, we see it as an invitation and trust whether or not that's gonna lead somewhere. What is the worst thing that could happen if you talk to someone about something that you're interested in? Like seriously, what's the worst thing that could happen? Is that you have a good conversation about something that you actually are passionate about. Oh my gosh, kill me now. (laughs) I mean, That's not a bad situation. What are some better outcomes? Maybe a new friend? I know, you know, that's a big deal. Scandinavian, we, a bit like the English, it's like, that's actually a scary thing. Um, You know, a new friend, or it could open up a whole nother chapter in their lives. So how do we do this? Look for the coincidence. It's not rocket science. For me now, whenever I see a coincidence, I see it as God saying, there you go, go knock on the door. I remember preaching several years ago in Kiev, and we, got, we have a church in Kiev, and I was walking down the street where I was staying, 
Walk past the restaurant. As I'm walking past this restaurant, I heard a Danish couple sitting there, it's just speaking Danish, in the middle of Kiev. Now, normally what you would do in that situation is that you'd message five friends. Oh my gosh, I just walked past a Danish couple in the middle of Kiev. That's crazy. What a coincidence. What if that's not a coincidence? What if that's an invitation? So I just walked over and said, hey, in Danish, I'm Danish. Where are you from? Copenhagen? Copenhagen? That's crazy. You know, so far, low stakes. So far, the worst thing that could happen right now is, all right, have a good night. They're like, do you wanna join us? Sure, again, what could happen? Maybe a drink, maybe a meal, okay? You know, again, low stakes. We're sitting down, we start talking, what are you guys doing here? You know, we're into fashion, we're doing da 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 great. What are you doing here? Well, I'm actually preaching in a church. And it's like, oh my gosh, when are you preaching? Tomorrow morning and tomorrow night. Oh my, is, can anyone come? It's like, yes, anyone can come. It's like, so how would we get, and you know what happened? It's none of your business, guys, stop asking. <laughs> Seriously, are you kidding me? Like I remember sitting at, at, at home in Denmark and I woke up this one day and I was thinking about this athlete, which is weird. Like I don't wake up thinking about athletes, guys. So just please don't write to me after. But you know, and I was like, that's weird. So I just prayed for them. And then I, I went out, had coffee and I opened the paper and there was an article about this athlete. And I was like, ah, oh, again, weird, coincidence. And then I went and had dinner with a friend that night. And as I'm sitting at the, the, the restaurant with a friend, I was like, Bro, like I woke up this morning thinking about this guy and then, you know, then I, I, I saw an, an article in the paper and he's like, and then what happened? And I go, and then, oh, there he is, walking into the restaurant. And I'm like, oh, and he's like, what are you gonna do? I was like, I don't know. And so at that moment, I was like, okay, God, if you make him walk out here and he walks past my table and he trips as he's walking past my table, in that moment, as he reaches out, I will hand him a flyer and walk away. <laughs> And so no, I'm like, okay, I'm gonna go in. So I walked in and he was in this awkward place and it like packed and I was like, oh, I can't get to him, this is weird. You know, so I walked back and forth, pretending I was gonna go to the toilet. They would've thought I was the most constipated person in the restaurant. You know, I'm walking and in the end, I just like pushed my way through and I was like, hey, excuse me, I just woke up thinking about you. Okay, that came out wrong, sorry. <laughs> I'm a Christian and I woke up and I actually was praying for you. And that's all I wanted to say, God bless you. And he was like, no, no, wait. You know what happened? It's none of your business. Seriously, guys, you are so nosy. I don't know what's happening in the other locations, but here's Central, they're way too nosy. It's none of your business. Because my responsibility was just to knock on the door. Just to knock on the door. I remember sitting in America, just I think it was last year, and I was sitting in a hotel reception. And the person saw that I had a what would Jesus do bracelet on. And she leaned over, she goes, do you know what that means? I said, I think so, but could you tell me? It's a Christian bracelet. And you know what Jesus, he would do? I was like, no. And then she went for it. I was like, whew, I better take this bracelet off then, don't I? It's like, yeah, you better, so I took it off. And then she was like, what do you think Jesus would do? There you are, I found you. You know, I was sitting next to a person on, on a plane and, and he, he, he turned to me, he's like, and I hadn't got my headphones far, on fast enough, so he engaged. <laughs> Sorry, just being honest, I feel like we're in a safe space. <laughs> he engaged and, and so he goes, um, hey, so, so what do you do? Being a pastor is like sometimes the worst because it just kills the conversation. So I go, well, I'm, a, I'm, 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 I'm an event manager. <laughs> Dude, uh, really? yeah, well, I am. It's like, okay, cool, what do you do? It's like, oh, we, like, we put on events, like, you know, once a week and sometimes midweek. It's like, oh, what day, Sunday? That's a weird day to have events on. It's like, yeah, it's a bit, it's a bit hard. And, and he's like, so, you know, wh wh where are you meeting? And he's like, well, I'm meeting this, this building called, you know, this. And he's like, oh, I used to, I used to know the owner of that building. It's like, oh, really? It's like, yeah. And he's like, that's weird. Like, what events are on there on a Sunday? And it, I was like, you know, okay, I'm a Christian. Okay, I'm a pastor. <laughs> and he goes, that's crazy. 
of just thinking this morning how awesome it would be to talk to a pastor. There you are. In March, I was back in, I was here in Manchester. I was walking down the street somewhere and someone stopped me. A TikToker, they're the worst, aren't they? But anyways, they, they, she stopped me, she's like, I've got some questions for you. I'm like, great. And it's like, let's talk about the economy of Manchester. I go, I'm so clued in on that, let's go. So we talked and then she stopped filming and she goes, what are you, what are you here for? I was like, oh, I'm, here, I'm from Copenhagen. It's like, why are you in Manchester? I was like, I'm actually preaching in Audacious Church. And she goes, I used to go to that church, but I don't anymore. I don't know if you're here today. today. If you are, welcome. Uh, come and say hi afterwards. Of all the people that she could have stopped on that day. See, God doesn't hide to be hidden. He hides to be found. He just hides to be found. And I don't know how many times in our team, in our church now, we have these what we call hide and seek moments where someone will say, oh, I was just thinking. I was just wondering about that. Crazy. I just re read in my horoscope this morning that I would meet an unusual person. I go, same. <laughs> what if there's no, no such thing as coincidences? What if every coincidence was an invitation? Worst thing that can happen is that you talk about something that you're interested in. The best thing that could happen is that we get to nudge them along just a little bit more towards the kingdom. So what are we doing today? If you will be open for the idea that God can be found in your relationships, in your finance, in your business, if you will be open for the idea that God wants to be found, if you will be willing to look for Him, there's a very good chance that you're gonna find Him. Now, why would God go through all of this trouble? because that is who He is. God has always played hide and seek with us and God is always the first mover. Think about the first game of hide and seek. It came out of a broken relationship. Adam, Eve, perfect relationship. I, 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 we know best, we're gonna do it our way. <sighs> Trust broken, relationship broken, safety broken. And they were hiding in their shame hiding in their good deeds, hiding in their religion, hiding behind something they thought would cover them. And who took the first step? Who made the first move? It wasn't man, was it? God's like, oh, man, I miss hanging out with my kids. Adam, Eve. Now remember when God asks a question, it's not for Him to get information. It's for us to get a revelation. Adam, Eve, where are you? And then he just waited. And I think today, church, God, He is calling out your name. These moments, we call them altar calls. These moments, we call them moments of decision. But really what it is, it's heaven's window that opens. And God, He calls out your name. He calls out your name and it rings out to the north and the south and to Geneva and Chester. It rings out across online. It rings out in this room in Central. He calls out your name and then He waits. Then He waits. Because God always takes 99 steps and then He stops. And the last step is yours. Because I miss you. That's not, gonna, that's not gonna cover you, that's not gonna help you, but I miss you. The last step is yours. We really hope you enjoyed that message today. To access more content from Audacious Church, please subscribe to this channel. You can also access Audacious Worship on all streaming platforms, and you can also find us on social media at Audacious Church. We hope you have a great rest of your day, and we hope to see you soon.